So I have the pleasure to introduce the next session, which is uh, Leadership Lessons for the Age of Uncertainty. Uh, just two weeks ago, we hosted our annual flagship conference, State of Asia in Zurich, and um, we had a diplomatic icon of Singapore, Bilahari Kausikan, with us, who called it the age of ambiguity. Um, and whatever you want to call it, we need uh, leadership. And uh, for this, we want to know how to navigate through uncertainty, manage through crisis, and build resilience. Um, and for this, we turn to Lieutenant General Jonim Bum, who uh, Yvonne asked me to say that he's one of her favorite person, most favorite persons. <laughs> um, I want to keep it short but I will shortly introduce the both of you. Um, Lieutenant General John looks back on a long career within the Republic of Korea's military, for which he has been recognized, uh, both in Korea as well as abroad. So in 1983, he was awarded the National Security Medal for saving his superior's life in the Rangoon bombing. In 2005, he was recognized by both the Republic of Korea and the United States for his contribution for the first fair and free elections in Iraq in January 30, 2005. In July 19, 2007, 23 Korean missionary workers were kidnapped by the Taliban and Lieutenant General Chun was credited with the successful rescue mission and was awarded the Korean presidential citation. In 2013, he was promoted to Lieutenant General and was assigned as the commander of the ROK Special Warfare Command. He retired uh, from active duty as of July 31st in 2016. Upon his re retirement, he conducted fellowships with the Brookings Institute, the U.S. Korea Institute at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and at the Sam Nunn School of Advanced Studies at Georgia Tech. The moderator for the session is Dr. June Park of Asia, Society, uh, of Asia 21 class of 2017. Uh, she's a visiting fellow and political economist at the Middle East Council on Global Affairs and at Georgetown University in Qatar. Concurrently, she's a non-resident fellow at the National Bureau of Asian Research in Washington, D.C. Um, I think with that, I will just hand over. The floor is yours. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, all the new 2023 Asia 21 Next Generation Fellows to Seoul and to our session on leadership in the age of uncertainty. Uh, my name is June Park, and uh, I will be moderating this session. Um, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Lieutenant General Chun for his time to devote to this dialogue, especially at a time when we have so much geopolitical turmoil around the world. And uh, I'd also like to thank Sanjeev and Heejung and the rest of the Asia Society, uh, Asia Society Seoul chapter for making this event possible. And uh, just to start off, uh, you know, breaking ice, I'd like to connect myself with Lieutenant General Chan for similarities in some uncanny ways. Uh, my sources are Wikipedia and NamuWiki. <laughs> I was born in Seoul 24 years after you. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> I believe that your mother was the first female diplomat of South Korea, uh, uh, an alumni of Boston University, if I'm not mistaken. Not Boston College, it's Boston University. Uh, she graduated with a master's in poli-sci, and uh, you lived in the U.S. as a child uh, from 7 to 10 years of age. Uh, well, I have uh, from uh, 9 to 11 years of age. You were living in New York for three years uh, due to your mother's assignment in New York. And I was in L.A. for my father's assignment in a different uh, line of government work of his. And we both returned to Korea. And currently, you are a board member of the National Bureau of Re Asian Research, and I'm a non-resident fellow of Nation National Bureau of Asian Research. But that ends there, and the level of bravery that... Lieutenant General Chan has is probably a lot more vast and wider than what I have as a, a pol political economist and not on the battlefield. So um, this is uh, a six minute introduction to our dialogue. Uh, I would call it geopolitical risk and geoeconomic challenges. 
first of all, we have some various types that we witness as geopolitical conflicts around the world. Five examples. Uh, U.S.-China tensions from 2018, uh, starting from the U.S.-China trade war. The ongoing war in Russia and the Ukraine, which we discussed in our earlier panel from last year. Then we have the Israel-Hamas war from this year. We still have North Korea's provocations uh, after the, uh, the failed summits uh, in 2020, uh, uh, that was before 2020, right? So Singapore and Vietnam uh, in the previous administration. And we also have some lingering tensions on the Taiwan Straits and some speculations about China's invasion of Taiwan. Uh, we're not sure how this would unfold, but they are clearly some of the various types of geopolitical conflicts that we have. Then the second, uh, second, second category that I would see as geoeconomic challenges in the global macroeconomic landscape, there are also five examples I'd like to throw. First of all, interest rate hikes, and then economic downturn, rising unemployment rate uh, in different parts of the world, including, including South Korea, not only in the developed world, but also emerging markets, and rising government debt U uh, in the US case, and household debt in the South Korean case. Then there's declining population in the developed worlds, the digital divide, and the question of digital inclusion, climate change, difficulty to close the gap between fossil fuel development, renewable energy. These are all witnessed last week at COP28. And then finally, political challenges, which are sometimes domestic, which are sometimes at the global level. So domestic challenges, I would say polarization of domestic politics and the rise of the far right, US elections coming up. Competition over industrial policies for domestic politics and some subsidy questions. These are semiconductors, uh, EVs, AI, AI, and data-related issues, emerging tech issues. Then we have the development of AI, and uh, related to what I'd like to ask you later on, related to military warfare, potential consequences of AI. Then um, weaponized interdependence that we discussed earlier in the tech panel. So in this uh, dialogue, I would like to um, ask you, Lieutenant General Chan, before uh, we delve into some of your perspectives, um, the leadership criteria, what, what should a leader possess in order to lead the era of uh, uncertainty? And I would like to hear from you in your own words how we, uh, not just 2023 fellows, but the next generation overall, should navigate the situation without having too many problems. Gee, I didn't know we were in that much trouble. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you, June, for that uh, great opening. Uh, I heard that you all passed the uh, math test at Incheon Airport. Two plus two is four, so congratulations. So with this uh, uh, question that we have as our theme today, I did what everybody does these days. I asked ChatGPT. I asked, what are the leadership lessons for the age of uncertainty? And here's what he or she said. In the age of uncertainty, adaptive leadership is crucial. Ah. Uh, embrace change, foster resilience, and prioritize continuous learning to navigate unpredictable situations effectively. Communicate transparently, build strong relationships, and empower your team to collaborate creativity. Flexibility, empathy, and the proactive mindset are key attributes for leaders facing uncertainty. Now you have it. Yeah, you just want to clap. So the eternal question, you know, what is a good leader? When I was uh, in high school, contemplating a career of, uh, of a military career, uh, which involves a lot of killing and dying, I asked myself, am I up to it? You know, what is a good leader? Is a, is a leader made or is a leader you know, fostered? And so hopefully during the next one hour, if, you, if any of you have these same questions, we'll be able to see if we can get a little bit closer to the answer of that question. So, this is not ChatGP, this is Inbam Chun uh, telling you what I think is a leader. 
First, in Korean, we call it shimji. S-H-I-M-G-I. It means a wick, a wick of a candle. A wick of a candle is at the center of the candle. As it burns, it lights its surroundings, and the quality of the wick, it, it, it shows, you know, it, 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 it will shine far or near or whatever. But the first quality of a good leader is the shimji. Now, in, in the English language, it is a combination of character, uh, confidence, and conviction. So it is, the, it is the center of that person's soul that is unwavering. But at the same time, it is flexible. So this is something that you guys have to think about. And it'll be no use asking, asking ChatGPT. I have already tried. Okay, so that's the number one quality in my view. The second quality is having a sense of humor. It's critical. From that sense of humor will come out wit. And when you are leaders, when you are the top dog of that organization or that room, when everybody is scared to death, your wit will unlock the frozen hearts and minds of those that are under you, who are looking to you for a way out. So having a sense of humor, having that wit, it comes from Shimji. <laughs> Third is empathy, caring. This is, this is very hard. When you are in a terrible situation, let's say somewhere in some continent where little children are dying because there's, there's, they don't have a dollar. What is, the, what is the wise thing to do? The wise thing to do is turn your cheek. Don't look. Imagine as if it's not there. That is the wise thing to do. But some of us, we just can't do it because we can't sleep at night. And so we know that although, you know, it's not in our best interest. We're going to sacrifice ourselves for that kind of ideal. That's a stupid thing to do, ladies and gentlemen. Again, the wise thing to do is ignore it. Don't care. But if you want to be a good leader, you must care. Now, in modern day politics, they're all adults, so I could use the F word, but I won't. <laughs> there are politicians who have mastered the art of pretending to care. Fakes. And then there are people who just don't care. The rich ones, the greedy ones, but we all know they will all burn in hell. <laughs> so that's our, con our, our consoles. So that's number three. Except for the United States. No, 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 no. This is, a, this is another sentence. Except for the United States, China, uh, and maybe the Russians smaller countries, and India, and smaller, smaller countries must rely on these superpowers. If God gave me a choice and asked me, Imba, which country do you want to be born? I don't know. Maybe, uh, uh, I don't know. But maybe not Korea, you know? Maybe I would have wanted to be born in a superpower country. But for those of us 
who are born in a non-superpower country, we must, as leaders, know how to deal with these superpowers, whether it's Americans, Chinese, Russians, or Indians, or whatever. For our people, we must learn to sacrifice our pride and deal with these big powers, knowing that in the next life, they will all be burning in hell because I truly believe that Kissinger is somewhere there. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But as non-superpower leaders, we must master how we will deal with the Americans. And it goes back to Shinji. You just can't suck, suck up to them. Well, that's not the answer. You can't just stand up to them. That's not the answer. But if you have Shimji, then you'll know. Finally, a good leader knows how to compromise. I know it's hard, especially at your age, when you don't know any better. I still have to know, find out how to compromise. But even though with your convictions and your confidence and your shimji and all that kind of bullshit, <laughs> you must know how to compromise. Negotiation means you're never going to get 100%. In fact, if you do get 100%, be careful. Negotiation is getting 50% of what you want, and the other guy or gal gets 50%, you know? especially in divorces, OK? So to know how to compromise. But do you know what a, so I talked about a good leader, the five elements. Do I need to recap? <laughs> but do you know what a great leader is? A great leader. A great leader is a person who knows he or she doesn't know everything, who's able to admit it, and because he or she knows it, what does that person want to do? He or she wants to surround herself with talented people. 90% should be yes men or women, OK? <laughs> but at least 10% should be people who have the character to tell you like it is. Politely would be nice, you know? And privately would be better. But so a great leader is a person who knows that he or she doesn't know everything. Finally, when you grow old like I become, you will realize that two plus two does not make four. It doesn't always equate that way. Life is not that way. Once you realize that two, two plus two can sometimes be 3.99999, or 4.00001, that's when you will know that you're old. <laughs> OK, that's it. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant General Chan. We had, um, and uh, actually, Sanjeev and Hee-jung prepared other questions for me to ask you. <laughs> Um, regarding decision making and also managing uncertainty. But I think you more or less touched upon those issues with the five criteria that you just mentioned, including the first one, which is Shimji, WIC. I think I'll take that with me. Um, what are some mistakes that leaders make uh, in these kinds of crises? And in your experience in the Korean military, what are some of the overcoming obstacle-oriented anecdotes that you could recall in relationships with superpowers or domestic management, any kind of case that you recall? So when I attended the Korea Military Academy, I studied military history, the uh, history of human warfare. 
And even at that age, I was fascinated by how people could fight and go to war. And it's different from modern day warfare. You know, they come to a place not bigger than, you know, a, a small island, and thousands of people will kill each other. And then they say, three days later, oh, we don't need it, and they all go back home. I would, I would question, how could this happen? And now I know the answer, because stu people are stupid. So there are so many things that I have uh, encountered that was so absurd and stupid. That's why I worry, because all the things that you listed uh, can be solved. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. We created it. That means we can solve it. But because I am still bound by uh, legal uh, regulations that I will not divulge what I know, I can't share all the horror stories, but I can tell you this. Uh, leaders, especially in government, a lot of stu people, stupid people are able to go there, get up to the higher level. It's not like business. Because business, every month, every quarter, you have a, you know, a bit how much you earned and how much you've lost. Government isn't like that. So in government, if you do choose to go to government, the smart thing to do is make sure nothing goes wrong. Status quo. So when, you, when you're good at that, the the opposite of a uh, leader, you know, the, the antichrist, he or she is very easily, they can very easily go up to the top and go into uh, leadership positions where they're not, you know, qualified. And that's why we have all these problems. And then because they got up there, they have these huge titles that they share with young people like you, and you think, oh, that person, you know, if they became minister of whatever, you know, secretary of what, that they must be really smart. No. They just probably were, well, I won't say it. <laughs> but don't be like that. You know why? Life is too short. I mean, it's really, really short. Make something of it. You know? I know you guys are scared. I was scared too. But at the end of the day, when you turn 60 or 70 or 80, and mock my words, you're going to be dead, okay? In five billion years, the universe will collapse. So accept it. You know? So we're all going to be dead. And when we face it, and as we face our creator, you know, whatever it is, we're going to ask ourselves, what the hell did we do? Most of us will say, oh, well, I have kids who went to you know, Harvard, <laughs> Yale, uh, Seoul National University. It's nothing. It's meaningless. So you have, to, you, have to, you have to figure out what is meaning for you. And if you would like, later on, I will tell you what meaning was for me. But anyway, these, these crises, these things that we have, basically people don't do their job. People in authority, peop especially people in government. And so it's, it's a sad state of affairs that those kind of people are in positions of responsibility and that's what makes it a dangerous world, and that's what makes you guys so important, because maybe some of you will be stupid enough to do uh, what you think is right. That's a very uh, <laughs> difficult... You weren't expecting this, were you? <laughs> difficult... Um, Lesson to learn, uh, as you probably witnessed through your career, uh, because I think I have also been disappointed by leaders around the world who are in high, high places, who seem to make decisions without considering the impact on the others. 
And uh, I think I resonate with you on this point. Um, we have uh, exactly 32 minutes, and I think that it would be the best of our time if we try to uh, accommodate as many questions as we, as we can with all of the people in this room. And uh, actually, before we go on to that, can I just ask one question? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I was wondering um, what you think military leaders should possess when AI capability is maximized? Uh, the Terminator. You know, it's yeah, it, it just it's it's just uh, logical that that's what we want to create as military people, and a soulless killing machine is what we want. So <laughs> humanity, I I mean, it, it was a movie, but now I see it that uh, it's coming. So. <laughs> June, I, 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 I'm really sorry to say this, but I'm, I'm almost, gl I'm, I'm glad I'm not going to live forever, because it will be in the trend of the military. Maybe not the U.S. military, but the Russians or the Chinese or whoever. You know, they will build a killing machine with AI that will decide whether to kill or not, as programmed. It will not have emotion. It will not have guilt. And that's the kind of soldier that we want. And so if, if unregulated, that's what they will get. And if we do regulate it, they'll always be cheating. So it will be a very elusive um, problem to take hold of. So that's a big worry for me. And hopefully I won't see it. That's a dismal future. Uh, let's open it up for questions. Uh, June, oh, let's yeah. take two, three at a time, rather two, than one okay. question at a time. Yeah. That's so. great. OK. Uh, hello. Hi, uh, Lieutenant General. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And I am Ashutosh from India. I want to pick up the last thing you said. Um, we should be stupid enough to do what we feel is right. But often, the perception of right and wrong, it varies from people to people. There have been a lot of leaders who, in the pursuit of truth, have led wars, right? So how do you see uh, leaders like us should see right and wrong? What should be our uh, you know, parameters to judge what is right and what is wrong? That's a great question. Uh, thank you. Um, General, uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, well, I just want to express the appreciation of your comments, the very kind comments, except that I probably would have not agree with stupid people in the business uh, uh, because I've seen uh, two global financial crises were caused not by politicians but by bankers. So, but um, my question is uh, particularly with the, your fear about the Terminator. Um, does leadership require killing? I mean, in your aspect, you're a military, so, and you're, you're trained to kill. Would we have a world, eventually, probably an ideal world, where conflicts can be uh, eventually resolved without having to resort to killing someone? I have a short memory. Hi there. Thank you so much. For, it's been a very refreshing uh, session and just to hear someone who's so frank about uh, the situation. Um, my question is about, we've been talking a lot about global superpowers and the rise of China and, and a few of us were talking about realistically, I mean, it's, the world is changing and shifting and a lot of the um, international systems like UN, the constructs post-World War or post-World War I, World War II, are they relevant today? We look at the Security Council, the members, permanent members. What's the relevance? What's their function? We see the genocide taking place in Gaza um, and zero ramifications and invoking chapter, what was it, 99, the recent one? Seems, nothing seems to work. So 
Real, really, when we talk about a changing new world order, what does that look like for smaller countries, for different powers? The 10 biggest economies are not going to be these Security Council members in years to come. So just interested to hear your thoughts. Thank you. So, right and wrong. I'm a Christian, so I go by the Bible. In the Garden of Eden, God gave man everything except for the fruit of knowing what is right and wrong. Why would God do that? Well, I think God did it because once we bit into that apple, his concept of right and wrong and his concept of right and wrong was different. God knew that we were going to fight over right and wrong. So there's no real answer to what is the absolute right and absolute wrong in my view. But I can tell you this. Uh, choose what is right, but do what is good. You must think about what that means, okay? Choose what is right, but do what is good. It'll take you a lifetime to figure that one out. But a person who constantly is searching for the answer of that question, and a person who does not search for that answer, are two different people. So, killing, yeah, you know, uh, I lost a lot of men. I've seen things that I would not want any of you to see. Uh, I know that fighting has no right and wrong for sure. There's just killing. My antidote is just kill them as painlessly as you can. Now, you know, I'm a kind of guy that... I I really cry when a kitten is hurt or a dog is, is hurt. But I don't feel remorse that I had to order my men to do things to protect my people. So unless you're able to do that, you should not be a military guy. And that's a problem that many of our Western societies have. What I mean by that is uh, Western society, many of you might not know how much Western society, especially the American military, goes to protect uh, civilians, to not create collateral damage. To me, as a military man, it's ridiculous. They want me to go in and make sure that this person is not a threat before I shoot. How in hell am I going to know that? The better answer is shoot first, and if you made a mistake, say, oops, and be done with it. That's what our opponents are doing to us. And because we put ourselves on a higher pedestal, a moral pedestal like this, uh, the, op the, the, the opposition, especially the extreme opposition, has identified this as a weakness. And so, you know, uh, killing is unavoidable. And in my view, the best thing is to get it over with as soon as possible. But better is not to go to war in the first place. And that's probably our jobs. Because no matter what you're doing, whether you're a teacher, banker, or whatever, you know, the neighborhood thug will never be uh, satisfied with you know, lunch money the thugs will always ask for more until 
you have, you'll have to give something that, you know, you can't. So you need strength. <laughs> Money will not bring you strength. A nine millimeter handgun will. So uh, investing in a strong military, investing in a society that knows that security is important is critical. So let me just finish at that. And for you, young lady, uh, what's happening in Gaza is very unfortunate. Um, again, there's no right and wrong there either. There's just a lot of killing. What is different about this situation, in my view, is that Hamas, from the very beginning, targeted women and children. Not even the North Koreans do that. And because Hamas did this, the people in Gaza, the people in Israel, are paying a big price. And I was hoping that this situation would subside by the end of this month, but you know, it's gonna be tricky. But I'm still keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, and because, as you said, international organizations have reached a limit. Um, I, you know, I honestly think that unless we uh, are at the cliffs, at the precipice of humanity, that we will not learn our lesson. Global warming, I mean, I can feel it right now the dangers that we see. Uh, North Korea has nuclear weapons. Uh, I think Iran already has nuclear weapons. And if the Iranians uh, you know, admit that they have nuclear weapons, what does that do to you know, the, Israel? So the international uh, organizations, namely the United Nations, has lost its relevancy. And but it's how humans, you know, how how we've uh, evolved so far. So, what will happen in the next 40, 60 years is up to you. And so, uh, you know, you're more <laughs> important than you might think. So wherever you are and whatever you're doing, uh, do your best in trying to save this earth, uh, not for yourselves, but for all the you know, cute dogs and cats that I cherish so much. <laughs> okay, we have another set of questions. So let's go from this side, the opposite side from here. There's another one in the back. Too. So we'll go like this, collect okay. three. Um, okay. Thank you, Lieutenant General, for your candid and uh, great comment. Uh, my name is Richard. I'm from Cambodia, so that might explain my applaud after your Henry Kissinger comments. My question to you is: a lot of people in leadership, they still have someone that they need to answer to, and how do you face a situation where that person, one more rank higher than you, asking you to carry out a plan or execute a plan that you disagree with or might be unethical? So hello, uh, General. Thank you very much for the speech. Uh, I have a question more about history, um, especially if there is any military leader in history you particularly admire, and more in the context of the recent movie. What do you think of someone like Napoleon Bonaparte? <laughs> Which one? Napoleon. Napoleon. Very disappointing. Thank you, General. I want to pick up the thread you unfinished uh, previously. It's a personal question. Um, what's the purpose or meaning of your life? <laughs> Has it been changed during your lifetime uh, so far? <laughs> Thank you. Slightly similar to what uh, my colleague over there just asked you, uh, General. So. I come from a country, again, uh, where there's heavy military influence from Sri Lanka. 
And what I've realized is, um, especially in my country, we feel the military is readily available to always protect the leaders and the elected representatives as opposed to the people. There's so much of oppression coming towards the people, but I believe it should be other way around. And I would like to hear your thoughts about this and what kind of experience you've had on this. Thank you. Yeah, so mm, so my secret is when my superior told me something that I didn't like, you know, I followed orders. But it was, if it was unlawful and not, uh, in that unethical, I would answer very you know, promptly. Yes, sir. And I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know, until they pushed me and pushed me and pushed me. And still, I would not do it. And I was lucky enough to get away with it. So it's all about luck. But there are many reasons why we should not do things that are unethical or illegal. First, if you do something illegal, that is not an excuse. You are responsible, too. So don't do it. For unethical things, you're not going to be able to sleep at night. And if you become numb to those kind of things, then your soul is corrupted. So, but we're not all perfect, OK? It's OK to make mistakes. But remember that, so today, Yesterday, I should not have had that chocolate, right? But it was so tempting. But at least I only ate one instead of two, OK? So that's life. So try to just don't say, oh, everybody does it, so I'm going to do it. In fact, I'm going to be more corrupt than everybody else. Don't do that. No, you, you have to follow the flow, but always try to be better than yesterday. Napoleon, so it opened in Korea the other day, uh, Wednesday. So I'm the kind of guy that went there at 6.30 in the evening to watch it, and I almost shot myself because, <laughs> did you see the movie? Uh, the battle scenes were mediocre, you know. Uh, I didn't even like uh, Marie Antoinette getting her head cut off, you know. So. They try to put too much into the movie. So, but they, Napoleon is a tyrant and a great man at the same time. But you have to look at the circumstances that he was in. So look at, look at if you look at the movie, uh, he comes from a he starts his life from a position where he has nothing to lose, only to go up. And when opportunity arose, he had the courage to go for it. Many of you seem to be in, in financial areas. How many times have we seen a sure thing and yet we did not invest because we were not 100% sure. Because we were afraid that we were going to fail. But Napoleon, whether he was crazy or you know, tormented or whatever, he did it, right? So let me just say this. A great man has great attributes. But great men and great women also have great faults. You know? So it's OK if you're not perfect. As long as you know, you're not killing a dog or torturing a cat and hitting women or hitting men in the case of women. <laughs> For me, when I was 24 years old, I saved the life of a Korean four-star general. It was during the military junta years here. 
can you imagine what that did to my career? And it was all caught on, caught on TV. I became an instant hero, a model of the military. But, but I knew uh, this was all a dream. Before this incident, you know, I wanted to be rich and famous and all that kind of bullshit. But when that happened, when all this fame and everything came to me, I knew it was not going to last. So, and, and, so I, and, I, and I saw how many stupid people became general officers when I was 24. And I thought to myself, holy crap, if that nincompoop can become a general, I can become a general. Yeah. So what was, the, what, what was I going to be the purpose of my life? It took me about five years to decide that my purpose in life would be to better the world. And I thought, OK, that's a really stupid goal. And it will never work in reality. And so I'll never make general officer. But that's the, role, that's the course that I chose. So I tried from age 30, when I was a major, to get myself thrown out. You know, I did not follow orders that, I did not, that was unethical. I did not follow orders that sacrificed my men. I didn't say, nope, I'm not going to do it. I said, yes, sir, I'll, yes, sir, I'll, yeah, yeah. but I did do it. <laughs> you know. When my men were hungry, I stole food and made sure my men were fed. When my men didn't have you know, uniforms, I attacked the storage, you know, and I got uniforms for my men, boots for my men as well. And to the credit of the Iraq military, they made me a three-star. They did not make me a four-star, which was fine, because I was relieved. But to your question, I wanted to make the world better. And I think I did, a, did my part. Uh, yeah, so I can relate to your predicament. The South Korean military was like that. There's a recent movie that came out in Korea about two, three weeks ago called Seoul Spring. More than five million Koreans have seen it. It's about the coup d'etat in 1979. It's about how uh, Major General Chun no relation, uh, overthrew the <laughs> government and became the next president of Korea. But this guy, what he did was, he did a lot of bad things, but what he did was he, he gave up power and he allowed all of this. Look, 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 look out there. We didn't, I didn't have that when I was a young boy. But he allowed all of that. And all of that only comes from creativity. When people are free to invest, to study, to, to make love, you know, to, to sing, to get drunk. You know. And when freedom came, it changed society. And I'm not sure how Sri Lankan soldiers become soldiers, but we have a conscript military. And because of conscription, our soldiers will not follow orders to shoot their civilians. No more. So that's how Korea evolved. So as a Sri Lankan, I can relate how frustrated you might be with your situation, but as a Korean, I can tell you, if we Koreans can did it, there's no reason why Sri Lanka can, should not be able to do it. One of the secrets of us Koreans is that in 1947, when we were starving, when people had nothing to eat, when we relied 100% on American aid, we still invested 15% of our uh, national budget to education. So in 1947, our illiteracy rate was 
close to 80%. By 1955, it fell down to 5%. Koreans, within a very short time, learned how to read and write Hangul. So education is the key, and not losing you know, the goal, no matter how hard it is, to better the world. So we'll do another, uh, okay, this side and towards the, the back. I think there were some early questions in the back. So uh, I work in Myanmar, um, and so I know for many other folks as well, we're working or living in countries that have a high influence by the military, as in Sri Lanka as well. I guess what I'm wondering is, <clears throat> um, what would you say are the major differences in either the decision-making process or the value system between military governments and chains of command and civilian? Uh, greetings, my name is Iskandar, I'm from Kazakhstan, and uh, my question is related to the world order and the changing dynamics. Uh, you mentioned specifically how military and warfare and tactics and dynamics are changing. But at the same time, we um, misunderstand or omit the concept of strategic thinking from different cultural backgrounds, specifically when we look at the Western concepts or the warfare, we look at from the Clausewitz in like a kind of domination, destruction, like a destroying the enemy. And when the, there is a, for example, the Chinese, the Weiqi approach, etc. So it's got a different tactical approaches. But when we see that Asian countries are growing the Indian, the Indian economy, the Chinese, the South Korean, the Japan, etc. So we see how the different traditions can affect the military thinking. Do you see that these are very much important? The cultural aspects in the military uh, warfare are important? And uh, do you think that misunderstanding of culture in this respect can create some problems? And if we understand correctly, do you think that will help the world to be a much more secure place? So uh, it's obvious that in the military, the decision-making process is very uh, doctrinated. You know, we, we know exactly the process of decision-making. We get a mission, we gather the facts, we look at the options, we compare the options, we choose the best option, then we allocate responsibilities, and then we execute. In civilian, I think the basic process is probably the same. I've never been to a uh, civilian company. But I think in your world, it's much, much more complicated, more variables. And because of this, Although there's a, there's a uh, format uh, in the civilian sector, like I said, every month you can s see how well you did or ho how well you did not do. And so there are consequences to be uh, answered to. And so, you know, for, for the civilian sector, it's much more doggy dog and, you know, Man, man eat man kind of a deal, so much more, much more cruel. In the military, our decision-making process is pretty much uh, what we call uh, military doctrine, and it's pretty much the same in all militaries. And the only difference is some militaries follow their doctrine and some militaries don't follow their doctrine. And the latter is the Americans. So the Americans have a great doctrine, but they usually don't follow their doctrine. What that means is they're masters at improvision. So their free will uh, way of thinking is unmatched. Now, it's not racial. You know, I've, I've, I've seen you know, Russian officers and soldiers, Turks, you know, Turks, uh, Tur Turkish military is one of the best in the world. Uh, Japanese Self-Defense Force, the Koreans, you know, the Chinese. 
the, the Americans are very unique. Uh, bordering on the Americans, I think, are the Australian military. They don't follow their own doctrine, but they're, they're very good at improvising. Uh, you asked about cultural differences between the East and West. So this is what I think. I think 3,000 years ago, the Chinese had a war for 700 years. For 700 years, they fought. And after 700 years, they thought, oh my God, what is the meaning of life? And it was in the form of Confucianism, you know, that the world should be as such. So they tried to come up with an, uh, with an answer. While all this was going on in the West, in Europe, the Romans, they were just killing each other, you know, uh, invading other countries and doing that. So uh, have you noticed until very recently, until the 80s or 90s, that in Asia, the only science fiction movie was Godzilla? And the <laughs> in the Western world, it was Star Trek, you know, go where... The original Star Trek s series of 1960s, if you look at the, that movie, they had people being teleported, you know, from ships. Who thinks of those things? <laughs> Only people who understood what quantum physics is. And the Americans, the Western civilization, they knew these kind of things. And they're making it into reality as we speak. So there's a difference. Even if the Chinese have millions of soldiers and state-of-the-art you know, weapon systems and even AI, it'll be very difficult for them to beat an American pilot. You know, an American pilot and a South Korean pilot, we all practice uh, about similar levels of, of, of uh, flight training, but still, it's in the DNA of these American pilots to be very different. The Chinese are, I think, building their fifth uh, aircraft carrier, right? But the Americans have been operating Amer uh, aircraft carriers for 100 years now. Can you imagine the know-how that's in there? So for the time being, I think there's no military that can uh, surpass the American uh, military. Uh, and an extension of that is Western military power. And hopefully we'll never have to see you know, who wins. Uh, I warn my American friends, don't go to war with the Chinese. Because the way that we Asians fight is so horrible that it will drive the Americans crazy. Have you noticed in Hollywood movies, there's a lot of Americans fighting Germans, but very few Americans fighting Japanese. Do you know why that is? The Japanese way of fighting was so horrible. They wanted to forget. There was no glory in it. It'll be the same with the war with China. So there should, there should never be a war with China. And if there is, because of what I just said, because it is so horrible and it will be so uh, destructive for the American soul, I think it will be inevitable for nuclear weapons to be used. So there should hopefully never be uh, uh, a nuclear war. I, and I've surpassed your welcome here. It's okay. Uh, so Sanju, are there? Yeah. Sanju, do we have additional questions? Any other questions? For Lieutenant General Chan, no? Uh, we do have Penny session coming up soon, so let's just take one last question and then uh, we'll close the session. Hi, it's a question about leadership. Uh, I've come across some quite nasty leaders from my previous public sector uh, work experience. They're gonna burn in hell, don't um, <laughs> So my question is, how far can good-hearted leaders go? It's a genuine question, because I've really come across really nasty ones. 
uh, in the UN. <laughs> you know, I never miss a chance to talk to young people. And I tell them, look, live a stupid life. Now, I know there are many instances where at, the, at your stage of your life, you feel like you're being taken advantage of by these so-called smart people. So, yeah, be careful. Don't be taken advantage of. But at the same time, don't become like them. You know? Becoming so-called successful that way is simple. But we should not do that, just because it's not the right thing to do. And in the end, you would not be happy. And what is, what is the ultimate goal of life? It's to be happy, right? You know? So in the pursuit of happiness, do what makes your heart comfortable and not something else. But make sure you get a paycheck, OK? <laughs> uh, please give a round of applause for <laughs> Lieutenant General Chan. Thank you very much for coming to see us and talk with us.